Welcome. Thank you for spending some time with us in our for our uh, first quarter investment review at Versant Capital Management and a look for, brief look forward. My name is Tom Connolly. I'm President and Chief Investment Officer of Versant Capital Management, Inc. in Phoenix, Arizona, and I'm looking forward to spending some time with you here today. What we're going to do is briefly take a look at what's happened in markets, and I'm, I'm not going to do through the last quarter, I'm going to do market results through Friday, so you have some up, more up-to-date data. Uh, then we're going to take a look at some uh, measures of uh, economic activity and, and market uh, valuations, and then uh, valuations, and then we're going to finish with some key takeaways, and I hope to be finished in 15 to 20 minutes. So again, thank you for joining, and let's get started. So the first market results we're going to cover are what we call our disinflationary or deflationary hedges, and these are largely fixed income returns, bond market returns, uh, many categories of which do well in environments that are uh, disinflationary. And I'm going to focus on the year-to-date column for now, and I might reference some of the others. Uh, as you can see, there, there's red in the aggregate bond and treasury uh, market results. And the longer dated the security, like long-term governments, the more the larger the red number is. So year to date, uh, basically, in interest rate risk uh, was uh, penalized. Um, so the longer out the bonds were, the more negative the returns were. But you do see some black further down. So in the municipal markets, the long-term municipals and the high-yield municipals did well, even though uh safe investments like government bonds were penalized and what's happening there is the spreads the credit spreads on municipals uh, versus treasuries uh closed and that was beneficial for the municipal bonds and overcame the effects of uh, interest rates going up and we also see uh some uh, negative activity in the u.s corporate investment grade arena where uh, investment-grade bonds, the, the rise in interest rates, did not compensate for the compression and credit spreads. Um, but in the high-yield bonds and leveraged loans, or the more risky bond investments, where there's a little less interest rate risk than in long-term government bonds, the credit risk um, was paid handsomely. So it's been a, a reasonably good year for taking risks in credit, but not interest rate risk. And we expect uh, that to continue. In terms of stock market returns, uh, the world stock markets are up 12, over 12% 12 through last Friday. The US is up 13, so the US and the world are approximately equal. Um, under the hood, the US is up, broad market is up 13%. Uh, the rest of the developed world is up an average of 12.65, so they're almost indistinguishable uh, year to date in results. So it's been a good um, year thus far on top of last year uh, for the markets, equity markets. And if we look at emerging markets, uh, they started out the year gangbusters. Uh, so these are uh, markets involving uh, less developed countries. And uh, China, the big gainer last year, is, is uh, lagging the pack this year. And we see countries like Russia, Taiwan, you know, some of the Asian tigers uh, doing well, uh, uh, along with uh, Greece and uh, uh, India. Uh, but the 9% lags, the developing market returns um, by about 3 4%. As I said in the, in the beginning of the year, the EM were, was leading the pack and they've gone back. And a lot of that's COVID related. There's been a uh, uptick at the beginning of the year in COVID infections, and especially in Brazil and India. Uh, so the, the comeback of that mar those markets will probably lag a little bit here, but be powerful toward the end of the year. Um, in terms of uh, stock market sectors, you can see here year to date, Energy and financials uh, have been leading the pack. And those um, are sectors that are somewhat dominant in what we call the value stocks. Uh, value stocks are made up of a lot of traditional energy and financial stocks. And uh, year to date, they've been doing quite well. 
and uh, uh, much of the rest of the market outside of uh, you know other cyclicals uh, are single digit returns. Now, if you go back and look at the uh, year one year numbers, um, they're all they're good across the board, and you can see in, uh, information technology and telecommunications uh, come in strongly. Uh, and, and those have been the categories that have really led over, uh, especially infotech, you can see has led over the last five and 10 years. But there's been this pronounced shift year to date in uh, energy, financials, industrials, the things that are more sensitive to economic cycles um, as we emerge from uh, the market broadens and we emerge from the COVID decline. We expect that trend uh, to continue. In terms of... in. Uh, investments that are sensitive to unexpected inflation. It's a primary investment belief of ours that uh, democratic governments uh, generate, have a propensity to generate more inflation over the long run. It's a fundamental investment belief. So we always have extra investments in the portfolio that are sensitive to unexpected inflation. And now you're reading more and more and more about that. And we're actually seeing price inflation spike and we have another session on that that'll be uh, similar to this one that'll be available to you that focuses on that idea. Uh, but year to date, there have uh, been good returns on inflation uh, in investments that are sensitive to unexpected inflation, mostly growth type investments like real estate, um, commodities, crude oil or energy, traditional energy related and uh, master limited partnerships that focus on the transport of oil and natural gas. And you can see those results are very good the year to date, but if you go back out over five or 10 years, they're not very good at all. So you have a, 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 a sector that's coming back from un years of uh, lackluster returns and underinvestment in terms of capital expenditures uh, starting to come back. And we have some of these things, uh, exposure to some of these in our portfolios. And we think that uh, the risk for unexpected inflation is not certain, but it's much higher than uh, most art market analysts suggest. So I just wanted to spend a few minutes on COVID uh, and its effect. Uh, if you remember back last year in our February uh, seminar, we talked about how we thought this would be a, a, a terminal of uh, an event that was uh, had some finality to it. It was finite and would end. And uh, the vaccines came out a little sooner than we expected. But what we're seeing now, if you look on the left, is that all over the world, uh, infection rates are going down from their latest peak. And in most of the developed world, we have uh, uh, va uh, high levels of uh, vaccinations, especially in the US, Israel, and now uh, in Europe, and they're starting in uh, EM markets. So on the right, you can see the percentage of the population on two different dates that have uh, received at least one dose of the COVID vaccine. And um, it's uh, the UK, the US, Israel's not on here, but they have a very high uh, vaccination rate and uh, Europe and some of the developed markets are catching up. So, and you can see the economic uh, results in these economies kind of marching in tandem uh, really with the vaccination results. Um, also, in last year, we talked about our view that it would be a fairly sharp recovery, and that's indeed what's happening. Um, on the left, I hit, we have the Wall Street Journal forecast from November of last year, which showed a, um, the trend of real GDP, then COVID hits, and you had a steep decline, and then kind of a square root-shaped recovery. Um, if you look at the forecast a little over a month ago, you see actually a recovery back to trend fairly quickly. And the economic data is coming in supporting that. So we still think the recovery will be swift as we come out of the COVID period with the vaccinations and then the uh, number of people who've actually had the disease as we approach 50 to 70% combination of vaccinated and infected, depending on who you read, um, that should give us um, that should give us control over uh, the infection rate and the economy and uh, recovering. And so what we're seeing indeed is a very strongly responding uh, economy. These are the uh, purchasing manager um, indices uh, from ISM. Uh, on the left is manufacturing, on the right is services. 
And basically what this means is uh, relative to the number in the middle, 50, if it's above 50, it's a diffusion index, so it means activity is expanding. So we see results over 60 for both manufacturing and services. And if you look at the time series going back, you can see that's a very healthy number. Um, and we're starting to see these numbers tick up uh, in a similar way in Europe uh, right now as well. And then the response around the globe, um, the global recovery, as I mentioned, is mirroring the COVID experience. Uh, so we see um, the PMI indices I just went over uh, in the previous slide on the right, showing recovery uh, in the dark blue for the Eurozone is just coming up above 50. Um, and in the US uh, and for Eurozone manufacturing are very healthy and very positive. Uh, so European services are catching up. And then on the left, uh, economic surprises in the Eurozone are, are the highest, positive economic surprises. So the rest of the world is catching up. So the economic outlook looks very promising. Um, in terms of markets, uh, there's a lot of speculative activity, primarily in the US. Um, it's around the globe in the tech stocks, but in the US, we have a little bit of extra activity. Um, but recent the speculation's abundant, but some of the leaders of the speculation are starting to fall away. If you looked at the stock market returns at the beginning, you know the value categories, energy and financials are doing well. And te but technology um, and the NASDAQ here is starting to lag the overall market here um, in the latter half of 2000 or latter part of 2021, the last quarter or so. And then you can also see some of the real speculative activity, the SPAC index, which I'll, we're doing another session like this on bubble-like activity. Uh, are we in a bubble? Another 15 to 20 minute piece where I'll go over this in more detail. Um, but for 2021, since February, there's been a steep decline in the average um, uh, price of uh, the uh, special purpose acquisition company index um, of over 50%. So speculative traders who got into this are deep underwater. Um, and this is looking a little bit like early 2000, what happened to the technology and speculative sectors. We'll, we'll follow up, but our port, we, we're recommending portfolios that are light, uh, relatively light on these speculative elements going forward. In terms of uh, bond market investments, this is a busy slide. And in summary, what it's saying is it looks at how much am I getting paid to take credit or interest rate risk in different types of bonds. And if you look, you'll see preferred stocks, you'll see floating rate loans, emerging market debt, high yield. And what it's showing is what we're getting paid now in terms of a spread over safe treasury bonds is very low, below average in almost every category and near the uh, lows of the last 15 or so years. So the takeaway from this slide is in almost every bond category, we're not getting paid a lot extra to take credit or interest rate risk. And so we would prefer not to take it because in, the, in 2008 and again in uh, uh, 2020 during COVID, these bond market sectors, the, the declines in those in terms of percentages were on par with the decline in stocks, even though they pay a fixed yield. So we don't feel we're getting paid enough right now to take the risk of what might happen to them in another market decline. That's the takeaway from that slide. And then the stock market, in terms of valuation ratios, um, these are from on the left, emerging markets, uh, developed Pacific. Um, second from the right is developed Europe and EFA is the combination of the two. And then on the right is the US stock market. And the green is our favorite valuation indicator. It talks about how much we're paying for uh, a dollar of corporate earnings averaged over the last 10 years adjusted for inflation. So what we're trying to do is capture a business cycle. And in the US, we're paying $36 for a dollar of corporate earnings by that measure. And outside the US, we're paying half that or less than half that. And uh, this is something that's been the case now for the last three, four years. Um, and so uh, we don't believe the whole world is expensive or in a bubble, but the US is, is uh, by this metric, 
uh, very expensive, and it would pay to diversify or even tilt a little bit outside of the U.S. Um, uh, by this measure. And then here's a history of that valuation measure I was talking about over time. And so this top purple line is the U.S., and you can see what's ha indeed happened over the last five years or so, commensurate with the rise in the U.S. stock market. A lot of that has just been due to the fact that investors are willing to pay more and more for a dollar of corporate earnings. Now, earnings have increased, but one of the reasons the U.S. has done so much better than the rest of the world uh, is the fact that the investors have been willing to pay less than a, um, for a dollar of corporate earnings in Europe, Asia, and the emerging markets. Now, as you can see from the past history, that is not the case over history, that these markets um, wax and wane with time, some of them in a spectacular fashion. And so these trends are generally not sustainable. So that's another reason we like investing outside the U.S. right now. And lastly, if we look forward um, over 10 years, five to 10 years, uh, these are this is a compilation of return expectations compiled uh, from within 20, 20, uh, 2021, some fairly recently, looking at what we what different investment firms and investment banks expect for returns uh, from some of these types of investments. And you can see uh, there we have our list, our returns here, and then there are um, uh, Invesco, J.P. Morgan, Northern Trust, some very Vanguard, some very recognizable names. And down below here, we have an average of all of the observations, which include more firms than we have listed here, by the way. Um, so the, the expectation on inflation is 2%. And the expectation on fixed income returns going across here ranges from 1% for treasuries to about 3.7% for emerging market debt. Um, so these returns, uh, for the most part, don't and the municipals and corporates um, barely compensate for expected inflation before we even pay taxes or spend a dime. If we look at the expectations for stock markets, the expectations for U.S. stocks are a little over five percent. Um, for foreign stocks, a little over six, and for emerging markets, seven point three. So comment, uh, along the same lines as what I've talked about, a lot of the other providers of advice in the marketplace are echoing that the higher returns or expectations are uh, to be found outside the U.S. Um, as well. And then we have some uh, return expectations for the inflation-sensitive category um, as well, and those are not meant to, uh, those are not, those, some of those are high, some of those are not, but we actually hold them as a risk control exposure in our portfolios, uh, less to get the expected returns, more to protect us if there's a if there's unexpected inflation, which will adversely impact fixed income, and in the short term, adversely impact global equities. So just to finish um, uh, and summarize, there's historically huge fiscal and monetary stimulus going on globally, not just in the U.S., where with the latest Biden spending proposal that was passed, we are we are now, with, with a combination of monetary and fiscal stimulus, on par with the intervention for World War II and far in excess of the intervention uh, for World War I uh, in peacetime. Uh, so um, we've thrown way beyond money way beyond uh, anything we did in the global financial crisis and on par with what we did to win World War II. And so this is still working its way through the economy. Um, we have uh, sharp recovery, global recoveries, uh, starting in the U.S., expanding abroad. We also, uh, which are a bounce back uh, from deferred uh, um, uh, consumption, uh, during the COVID downturn. And then we've also run our inventories down, so there'll be a bounce there. Um, we're also looking at prices increasing ac across the board. Uh, most of the jump in the consumer price index uh, that you see reported in the media 
a, a big component of that is u for our used car prices and energy. Um, but other prices are also increasing. And at the present time, we don't know if that's due uh, to concerns about the fiscal and monetary expansion or just a recovery during uh, supply, uh, restricted supply and increased demand post COVID. But we'll find out shortly. Um, bond markets yields are not compensating for the risks in interest rates or credit, we feel. And um, a dollar of corporate earnings is much more expensive uh, in the U.S. than outside. Uh, and we think that a rotation into value stocks as opposed to growth stocks, which uh, is a similar position in uh, during the tech bubble, may still be in its early stages. So thank you very much for spending some time with me today. And I look forward to seeing you on some of our other presentations.